Democratic Republic of Congo, like many other former colonies, faced a long period of political instability and complicated maneuverings following its independence from its old colonizers, Belgium, in 1960. The next five years became known as the Congo Crisis, with the establishment of the First Republic ushering in a period of turmoil, which had various elements. To begin with, there was the anti-colonial struggle, compounded by yet another displaced Cold War battle, with the United States and the Soviet Union becoming involved. There were also successionist battles, particularly in the province of Katanga. Katanga was one of the richest areas of the Congo, with copper, gold and uranium mines. It was led by Moise Shombe, who declared independence from the rest of the country on the 11th of July, 1960. With much of these mineral resources under the control of Belgian industrial companies, the Belgian government supported the bid for independence, helping the police force to become militarized and sending troops. And at the center of the Katanga fighting forces were several hundred European mercenaries, many of them Belgian nationals. Eventually, the United Nations became involved, establishing a peacekeeping force in the area after its Security Council Resolution 143 of July 1960, which asked the Belgian government to remove its forces from the territory. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, set up a UN force which remained in the Congo until 1964. At its peak, it numbered nearly 20,000, but the soldiers' blue helmets were a sign that they were there to keep the peace and could only use arms in self-defense. The first UN troops arrived in Katanga in mid-July, and by September, the Belgian troops had all withdrawn. But not before Hammarskjöld had tried to intervene personally, only to be killed in a plane crash en route to the trouble spot. His death came in the middle of Operation Mortha, launched by the UN on the 9th of September, when it became clear that Chambé's mercenaries were still in control of the gendarmerie. The operation went badly for the UN, amidst claims that it still had no official mandate to do anything but keep the peace. The fighting dragged on in Katanga until December 1962, when the UN initiated Operation Grand Slam, which proved decisive. By 1963, the capital city Elizabethville was under UN control and the bid for independence was over. When an entire country becomes associated with an epithet like the killing fields, it certainly warrants inclusion in any list of infamous places. This was the term used to describe the mass grave sites of Cambodia in the late 1970s. Officially renamed as the Democratic Kampuchea, the country under the rule of the Khmer Rouge was a very grim place indeed. The Khmer Rouge was a radical political regime that formulated its doctrines throughout the 1960s in Vietnamese border camps. It believed that rural peasant farmers were the true working class proletarians and the backbone of the revolution. After a prolonged period of increasing their control over the rest of the country, the Khmer Rouge eventually captured the capital Phnom Penh on the 17th of April 1975, with Saloth Tsar officially becoming Prime Minister in May. Saloth Tsar is better known as Pol Pot. Once in power, Pol Pot could continue the doctrines that eventually saw between 1.7 and 2 million Cambodians exterminated, out of a population of only 7 million. Pol Pot promoted the idea of a primitivist agrarian future, this included a radical policy of relocation, with cities emptied and dissidents forcibly re-educated or disposed of in mass graves they were forced to dig themselves. The most well-known of the killing fields is Choang Ek. It now houses a Buddhist memorial to the genocide. The Khmer Rouge was eventually brought down following an invasion by Vietnam in 1979. The movement was not destroyed, though, with Vietnam using their existence as an excuse to retain its military presence in Cambodia, and Khmer Rouge representatives retaining their seats at the United Nations. Pol Pot fled and lived in the woods on the Thai border, before finally dying in controversial circumstances on the 15th of April 1998. He was never brought to justice for his actions.